Pray with me. Uh, God, this morning, each person sitting there or standing here or in the back, wherever, Father, I pray that today the message that you have for them um, is a message from you, not from me. God, I pray that I'm, uh, Father, just to, uh, just to use me in spite of me, God, for a message uh, that each person in here may have to their heart, each person. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen. Um, everything, everything has a starting point. Um, last week, we started to cover this, that everything has a starting point. You had a starting point. Some of you were planned. Some of you were on accident. That's okay, because we're all sitting here, and we love one another. Doesn't matter. Everything had a starting point. Our career has starting point. Our marriages had a starting point. Some of you tried to get all fresh and fly, and that maybe started it up. I don't know. But now you're sitting here with your spouse. You're like, yeah, see, look, this is what I do or whatever. Everything has a starting point. Everything does. And so last week, we started to look at this. We said if everything has a starting point, so does our faith. So does our faith. Our faith also has a starting point. And many of us in childhood, maybe, many of us, maybe in high school, middle school, high school, college, whatever, like something happened where our faith had a starting point. And maybe it's starting for some of you in this season of your life right here, that it's starting now. But see, something happens in the gap, right? We learn things like God is good, and God is good, God is great, right? God is great, God is good, let him thank him for our food, whatever. We say these things, like we learn these, and we learn things that God will reward us, man. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me. So like we learned these growing up. We learned in VBS to, on the felt deal that, the, that Jonah went around and then he got swallowed by the deal. And we, we remember like these things. We remember these things, right? And then adulthood comes. Adulthood comes. And then we start to, to, to see that the framework that we had begins to be chipped away a little bit about, you know, by adulthood. Like just the challenges, the rigors of adulthood, the things that each one of us have gone through or are going through. And what we learned to where we are now, there's this chasm in between. There's this place in between that, man, is this really? And we, we're looking around and we're like, man, I don't know. God, God is good, but man, I'm not sure if he's always good from what I'm watching on the news. And Jesus loves the little children of the world, but man, I'm watching this, this commercial that wants me to give 35 cents a month and, or a day, and it feels like it's not. Jesus isn't good to all the little children. Like something begins to chip away, and then we're telling our children these stories about, you know, Daniel and the lions then, and the lions were in there, and they didn't even eat him up, and we're thinking, man, that's a good story, but man, I'm an, I'm an adult now. Is this, really, is this really working out? So sometimes what we have to do in a lot of things, especially in our faith, is that we have to just restart. We have to restart where we are, and we have to say, man, what are the quest what's the question that it really comes down to? What's the question that it comes back to? And it is a question. I'm fired up about this question, okay? It's not something I can just sit here and just, just talk about. It's a question that I've talked to many of you about that really started where you were. And the question was not, what does the Bible say about this? Or the Bible says. It wasn't any of that. It wasn't a question on, on man, how many animals were in the ark? You know, did they really do that? I mean, how did that work out? And then the dove flew? No, that wasn't the question that started it. How did the lions not kill Daniel? That wasn't a question. How did those three get in the fire and it not work out? How did he walk, how did he walk on water? That wasn't the question. The question that started for most of us was who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus to you? Because when Paul stood in front of people who didn't know anything about Jesus, and I talked about it last week, you can find it, it's great stuff in Acts, Acts 17. He stood in front of people who didn't know anything about Jesus. And he just said, this is who he is to me. And this is something that happened in my life. Like if you grew up and going to camps, whatever it was, and, and maybe you've been to a camp or you came down the aisle, it was someone who stood before you, a pastor, a preacher, a teacher, a, a priest, or whatever, that told you that something happened in his life. And that's what you were impacted by. And so when we look at the, when we look at, the Bible. It's not just, the Bible says is not the, an adequate starting point, is it? You cannot go to your, your co-workers tomorrow. You know, James, you can't go to your co-workers tomorrow and stand up in your cubicle and say, everyone, the Bible says. And many, I mean, you, the security would run you out for one, but you, you'd be like, people would be like, no, that's not going to be the start, really. That's not the start. It's not really the start for it. It's what happened. 
And so the question it comes back to is, who is Jesus? And remember, I said that last week, and listen, we're going to come full circle back to that. Stay tuned. It's going to be great, I promise you. But today, what we're going to do, today, we're going to tackle a term, and we really do have to tackle this term, because if you just come up and just barely, you know, touch it, doesn't work out. You have to really tackle this term that we're going to talk about today, because what it does is that it rears its ugly head in church. It rears its ugly head in church circles. It rears its ugly head for those who grew up in church and went through this gap. It rears its ugly head. And when we get in this in the discussion about about faith, the the term that we struggle with and that we have to tackle tackle today is the term sin. Is the term sin. Because think about it. It's kind of antiquated. It's only a church word. Like, you, you're, you know, you let, your kid, you know show, let your kid say something. You don't say, you sinned against me to your child, do you? You know, let them, let them come miss curfew. They don't come in and you say, you sinned today. We don't say that. We don't, we don't use it. It's an antiquated term, right? We don't use that term because we don't want to talk about that term. We don't want to use that phrasing. We don't like that word. Think about it. Judges and police, they pull you over on the side, roll the window down, sir. You've sinned against us. And the government, that doesn't, I mean, we, you know, that doesn't happen, right? It doesn't, we, that, that phrase is not used. And it's uncomfortable because that term, that term leaves us no wiggle room, does it? Like, for most of us that know, like, know the term, it leaves us no wiggle room. Like, it, it's like, man, when you use that term, that's, that's it. And I don't want to use that term. There's no one to blame. There's no out. It's heavy. It's weighty. It leaves us feeling a bit hopeless, right? And even the term feels, it it makes us feel, it makes us feel condemned. It makes us feel that way. So we substitute that word with another word, a word that gives us room. And it's a word that we use all the time, and it's mistake. See, the word mistake gives us room. The word mistake sounds, sounds hopeful. It gives us an out. It gives us the willingness to say, I can find correction from that. I can. And we'll use mistake. Now, listen, it's simple, real in here. Like right now, I could just say, all right, all right, cool. Everybody in here, everybody mistakes in, whatever. Everybody in here. If you've made a mistake in your life, raise your hand, right? Right. You would feel, many of you looking around, raise your hand, made a mistake, yeah, yeah. Now you're feeling, if you don't raise your hand, you're embarrassed, right? Yeah, if you don't raise your hand, you know, but let me me quickly substitute the word for if you've sinned in your life, right? Many of you are like, oh, yeah, but, you know, sin is like, oh, man, okay, if you have sin in your life, I don't know. I mean, that leaves me no room for mistakes, yes. Correction, right? You can, you can do that. See, a mistake, listen to this. Let's just, let's just talk about it for a second. A mistake is something that you make on a math test, young people. Isn't that right? My, my little eight-year-old will bring his papers home. We've studied for the spelling test. We've studied for whatever. He'll bring it home, and he got like a, you know, 80% on something. And I'll be like, what? But we looked at, we did this. Like, we talked about it. You, you, you knew. Oh, man, I, I just... I made a mistake. So what do we do? We get the eraser. All right, let's do it three times. Let's write the word three times, right? Because we feel like we can correct it. We correct those things. We feel like I can correct that. I can do something about that. I can, listen to the wording, I can do something about that mistake. Politicians have stood in front of you and said, I made a mistake by having that affair. It was a mistake. And we've looked and we said, oh, man, he he made a mistake. This can be corrected. This is fine. We can figure this out. You see, because if you're following along and you should be in your bulletins, you can look at this. A mistake involves this, insufficient knowledge. This is what a mistake involves. We can come back to this and say, oh, I didn't know. Or, or you know, we say, I, I, didn't, know, I didn't have that, all the information, and I made, I, made this, I made this mistake, I made this error. And the implication is this, okay? Because what, what do we do? We substitute the word sin with mistake in our lives. Here's the implication, is that we didn't know better. I didn't, I didn't know better. I didn't, I didn't know. 
And here's something I know about all of us, right? Here's something that we know about all of us. We don't even like to talk about mistakes. We don't like to talk about sin, of course, no way. Even mistakes, like, man, oh, man, I made a mistake here. We don't like talking about it. But sometimes, how about this? We make mistakes on purpose. Sometimes we make mistakes on purpose. And you're thinking, is that even possible? How about this? Sometimes we plan our mistakes. Like you've got the secret credit card that, that the husband doesn't know about. You've planned the mistake. You have the secret place on your computer that no one else can get to. But when, when, when you're found, it becomes a mistake. Like I really made a mistake. Well, we premeditate our mistakes, don't we? We, don't, we know the term premeditate. I mean, that you've gone ahead of and thought it out to make this mistake. And what do we do? We make the same mistakes repeatedly. How many times have we done that with our spouse or whatever, with our friends? We made the same mistake repeatedly. And, the, and again, the implication is that we didn't know any better. It was a mistake. I didn't have all the knowledge. I'm not perfect. Look at their marriage. Look at ours. Come on. Seriously. Really? Come on. And we say, man, I can correct a mistake, right? But you can't correct you. Because we try, don't we? We pay $120 every session to go in and say, I need you to correct me. I need correction. Or I'm going to read this book so I can get correction. Or I'm going to stop drinking so much and this is what's going to happen. I'm going to be corrected. Or I'm going to stop gambling so much. Or I'm going to stop going to this place or this site or going to this or hiding or doing this because we feel like we can be corrected, that we can do something about it. So we replace the word sin with mistake because we feel like we can do something about it. We've tried to be corrected. We've lost friends. We've lost spouses. We've lost relationships because of our mistakes. What do you call a, re a premeditated mistake that hurts somebody? What do you call, when you really strip it back, what do you call a, uh, those terms when you say, man, I'm not, I'm not a sinner, I'm just a mistaker, is what I am. I'm not a sinner, that's terrible, don't say that. I'm a mistaker. But today, here's what, I'm, here's what we're getting to, and you are feeling, yeah, probably deeper into your seat right now. You're thinking, this isn't hope, you're community church, and fun, and lunches, and tumblers, and everything else, and I need some hope. What's going on here? Let me tell you. Let me tell you this, okay? The deeper thought, it's deeper than you just being and I just being a mistaker, someone who makes mistakes. The deeper thought is this, that you are a sinner. That you are a sinner. And I am a sinner. And young people, you are a sinner. The deeper thought is for us to just say, okay, now, what, there's no wiggle room now. So what are you going to say about it? What, don't call me a sinner because now there's no, there's no way. And that's where we miss. Because a sinner is someone who knows better but does it anyway. And haven't we been there? A mistaker says, I can figure it out. A sinner says, I can't figure it out. And here's what I'm sharing this with someone this, this earlier. Here's what the enemy wants to do to you. He wants you to feel like you are such a sinner that you can't come to an almighty God. Listen to the irony of this. The enemy wants you to feel like you have to get good enough, that you have to correct yourself good enough to come to God. So then the message is this. You can't get good enough. Have you tried this? You try to get good enough, and you become worse. Because here's what the enemy wants to do. The enemy wants to say, don't come near a community or a church like this. Don't come near a church. Don't come near a holy God because you are sinful. And you don't deserve anything but condemnation. So here's what you need to do is work your way. 
get better, get better, keep trying. And you feel like you're just trying, you're just trying, and you get worse and you get worse because you keep doing and you try to keep correcting and you don't have a place in front of an almighty God. And it's not like that. Jesus, Jesus points out our sin. And we can, we're going to look at it in just a second. He points out our sin, not for condemnation, but for restoration. If you viewed it this way, it would change everything. If the people who are, the seats that are empty right now, and I just have to say that they're, the seats are empty because in the community, there are people who are sitting in their house who don't want to go to a church where their sin would be pointed out because their sin, they feel like, would condemn them. And Jesus never condemned anybody because of their sin. He didn't condemn anyone because of their sin. He restored them. His purpose in talking about sin was restoration and not condemnation. Here's why. He believed that our sin separated us from a holy God. He knew that. He believed that. And he wanted to confront any sin that we had. So today, it's gonna, you're, it's gonna, it has to happen today. There has to be a change in your set. Whatever you raise, God punishes evil. God doesn't like people who sin, whatever. All the things you were raised with may need to be reset in this moment to understand that a Jesus who you say, who is Jesus? He's the one who restores those who are sinful. He restores you. He doesn't condemn you. He restores you. And his approach, if you think about it, you can look at it in Scripture, you can find it. It was amazing because here's what he did. For all those that said, I, got, I can be good enough, man. If I just I can get back to reading my Bible, if I can just do some things. If I can serve in the kids, I can get good enough maybe. He raised the goodness bar. He kept raising it. For those that were sitting there saying, I can be good enough. I can do this. He raised the goodness bar so high that nobody was good enough. That even the religious people, right? Remember the context when he, when he would come against and all the religious and all the Pharisees and all the scribes, people who knew the Bible front and back, Pharisees who walked around and did every practice. They, just, they were traditional. They, were, they did everything perfect. Do you remember when he came to them? He said, for I tell you, Matthew 5, 20, what does he say? For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, all the people that know the Bible. He was, just, he was just among the people. And he says, you see all these people, all these hoity-toities that are over there and all the Bible thumpers, all them carrying them and they're just, you know, doing this and you need to be, unless your goodness surpasses them, then you won't, you won't know the kingdom of God. So haven't we read this and said, oh my gosh, man, how, there's, there's no way. There's no way. There's no way I'm gonna be, I can be that good. And what do you feel? Hopeless. But then what if you read it in the sense and say what he's saying is the good, stop trying to be so good. It doesn't work like that. He even told them, you'll never be good enough. What you're wearing, what you're doing, what you're carrying will never be good enough. So he was saying this and we read it like, I've got to be better. I've got to be better. I've got to do, 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 do. And he's saying, no, stop thinking of it in this way. Those are full-time good people. That's what they are. They're full-time good people. So these people are saying, well, how good do I have to be? I better go and correct my mistakes. I better go and correct my mistakes. And he went on in verse 21. He says, you've heard that it was said that the people long ago, it says, you shall not murder. Don't murder. And they all were like, man, cool, man. I, I don't murder anybody. Many of you are hopefully all in here. And you're like, you know, you're like, man, cool. I don't, I don't, they're just like we are. Like we think, oh, this is old Bible stuff. No, like this is just an experience that someone journaled that Jesus is saying, you guys know don't murder. But he said, but I tell you this, if you're even angry against your brother, you've already committed murder in your heart. And there was this sinking feeling. Like, man, I just killed my wife this morning. Like my kids, they're... They're not, those aren't even my kids. Those are like zombies walking around because I was so angry. I mean, you, you, you think of it this way. You know what he was saying? We read this and we say, man, I can't get angry at anybody. I need to mark down how many times I've been angry and flipped off the part, you know, whatever. You're like, I've got to figure it. You know what he was saying? You won't be good enough. And then he's like, okay, well, man, because you're sitting here and you're, you know, you're like, oh, this is church stuff. This isn't really for me. And he's like, no, wait, hold on. I got one for you, man. Okay, how about this? All right, you've heard that it was said, do not... 
you know, commit adultery. Like, you know, don't do that. And you're like, oh, I haven't cheated on my wife, man. I looked at some things and stuff, but I've never cheated on my wife. No, that's not me. And he said, but here, let me tell you, if you've even looked at a woman lustfully, you've already committed adultery in your heart. And haven't we read this and said, I took the second look, you know? I'm mean, first look like that, and then I look back again. Oh, man, that's, that's adultery. And we've notched it down. Oh, Jesus, I need to say that's adultery. No, you know what he kept saying? He said, you're not, stop looking at it in this way. He goes on and on and on about this. He goes on and he told them, he said, look, you're all murderers. You're all adulterers. And he said, but God loves you anyway. And God incarnate stood in front of him, in front of them. And he said, and I love you anyway. Remember the woman who committed adultery? And they all brought her to him, and he's there with her, and, and, she, and they're just like, what are you going to do? What are you going to do, man? Because she deserves to be stoned is what she deserved. And she's sitting there, and you remember that many of us think that this is the Jesus that says, what are you doing? You're a sinner. You, need to, you deserve death. And then he flips it because this is the Jesus that we know. When we say, who is Jesus? This is the Jesus we know. That he says, who condemns you? Remember, he was real smart and he told them, look, throw the first stone if you, want to, if you have no sin in your life. And remember, they're like, not good enough today. Drop the stone, they go home. And there's nobody else around of this lady. And, he, and, and she says, remember, she says, Lord, no one. You don't just, call, I mean, she knew something that this was the one who could forgive my sin. You see, the problem with mistakes is that we do the forgiving. You know what I'm saying? Like we do the fixing. Like I can fix it. I can correct it. And it leaves no room for God. But sin leaves room for one, one entity. And it's not you. You're moved out of the way. It's God to forgive us and restore us. And many of you, you might have had an experience where you knew who Jesus was and you loved that experience. Like it happened in a, in a, in a church service. It happened at a, at a camp. It happened at a retreat. And you knew that. And then something happened in your life for a year's time periods of time where then you came, you said, I've got to get back to that relationship. There's not one of us who've said, I need to get back to that religion. You've never said, I, want, I, I need to get, become more religious. No, you returned. You, you, you and your spouse said, we have to get our family back in, the ch in church because of a relationship. Because you knew that the broken you the one who's been chipped away, needed restoration. And maybe you're here today because that's you. And you feel broken. You feel like, man, I, and maybe it was you, maybe it was others, whatever it was. You're sitting here today and you know that you need restoration. And the only one that can do that, and you figured it out that it's not you, it's not what, you know, all these places you can go and books you can read, that it's, that, and you, you'll say, we, we'll say it this way. It's church. But no, let's, let's, again, let's strip back the layer. Oh, it's man, it's good community. Let's strip back the layer. Okay, well, it's a, a preacher talking about the Bible. No, 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 let's strip back the layers. And then it comes back to Jesus. And he's the one who restores. And he's not the one who just says you're, he's, he doesn't say you're sinful. He says, I want to restore you. This morning, Jesus, and Jesus is in the lost business. You know this? That he doesn't want us being lost. He doesn't want us being lost. I know for Christmas, uh, I got, during Christmas time, I got one of these tiles. Because you put it on your keys, right? Because we don't like lost things. Like there's something in our spirit that we don't want anything lost. So somebody's making a ton of money, right, on these, where you put them on your keys, and then you get your cell phone, and you can find wherever the keys are. And anywhere within this room, I could push a button and it'll beep. Tim Jones, you need this, all right? And it will, it will beep and then you can go and find it because we don't like 
lost things, right? We don't like lost things. I was at a youth group thing the other day, and a parent couldn't get a hold of their, of their daughter. And what I mean by that is that they couldn't track their daughter who they have on their phone where the daughter is. Yeah, and many of you are like, that is just wrong. That is so wrong. No, I think that's amazing. Like, you know, the, like, you know the, the little dot is like moving towards Arkansas in a white van, and it's like, holy, get the police on the phone. You know, like, you're like, whoa, we don't like lost things. Parents, you're like, oh, the keys thing's smart, but don't do that to your kids. Are you kidding me? We're like this. We don't want, we don't want things that are lost. Guess who is in the same boat as we are? Is God. He doesn't like lost things. And when the lost thing returns, there's a party. There's not a you should have known and a scowl from the great and almighty God. And you're like, whoa, that's a cool. How do, what's your proof on that? How about just the, the prodigal son? How about in the, in the story of the prodigal son in Luke 15, when the son says, dad, I need you to die early because I need my inheritance, right? I mean, that's really what he said. He's like, you're not dying fast enough. I need to get all the good things that you give me. And, and everyone's like, what, you, what is he talking about? Right? He didn't even get half. Like, remember the older son got more, and he's like, just give me what you're going to give me so I can go. And haven't we said this, right? Like, like, this is like, whoa, gasp. We've said, like, God, bless me, and then we'll get the blessing, and we take off, right? And we take off like the son took off, and the son took off and just went and just spent it on everything. Like cloud nine, eggs and legs, whatever, was all over. He just spent it on legs and eggs, sorry. And he would just, like, go, and, and he was just like, I'm just going to spend it drunk, everything else. And then he found himself living a life, living a life that was so far away from what he knew before. And instead of him saying to the father, Dad, come on, man, everybody makes mistakes, man. There's a lot of people that do this. You know, come on, old heck of Maya down there, down the street, you should have seen what he did to his mom and dad. You see this, what room this leaves? But we hear the story, and we're like, man, prodigal son came back. That's a great story. But you know what he said to the father? This is the point. This is where we find ourselves today. And Jesus says, this is what he says. He's talking about the son. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. If you'll just take me in as anything, a servant, anything. Guess what? There's no wiggle room. And the son's words, I want you to hear this, the son's words represent the confession of a sinner. The son expected nothing, and he relied completely on the mercy of his father. He didn't feel entitled. I don't, I don't expect anything, God. I just want you to know that I've done wrong, and I'm a sinner. And some of us are so afraid to do that today. Because we think that the, the great almighty God who can step on us and say, not again, I'm not forgiving you. We think that's the answer we're going to get. And the father and everybody's around like, well, what's he going to say? What's he going to say, man? Where are you going to go serve? What are you going to serve down there? That's the worst place you can serve. No, he says, oh my goodness, everybody, go and get the, the barbecue, go and get the ring, go and get the best Put on, the, put on the Mary J. Blige, whatever. We're going we're gonna to kick it. And you know, and the message version says that they actually have a barbecue, okay? And so they come together. They put the ring back on his finger. And they said, you're, you're in the family, man. Let's party. Because he doesn't like lost things. And when you come back and you realize that your sin is an opportunity for restoration and not condemnation, You're in the family. The moral of the story of, of all of these lost stories when the, when the parties are happening is this, is that recognition of sin paves the way to restoration and redemption. You've got to write this down. You've got to put it in your notes because here's what's going to happen. You're going to leave here, and the enemy's going to say, cool message, man, but you're still terrible. You're a turd. You're a jerk. You're a loser. You're an adulterer. You don't deserve to ever come back to that church. Don't listen to that bald guy. Don't listen. Don't listen. You are still a punk You're because you, you just cussed your spouse out earlier. You just told your friend, but whatever. You just cheated on your whatever, whatever. You're going to leave here, and that's going to be over you again. So what I'm trying to say today is that you have to reset for a second and say this and recognize 
that your sin is an opportunity for restoration and redemption. Jesus, for all of us, says we're sinners who need forgiving. Right? We're just sinners who need forgiveness. If you still think that you're just a mistaker, and you're going to try to fix yourself, you're going down a wrong road. It's difficult. And today, and it's not tomorrow, and it's not next week as you're massaging this and thinking about it, because through somewhere in there, somewhere in there, you're going to get back to this idea of I can fix, you can fix yourself. And today is the day where you stop the playing around and just say, man, I'm a sinner. That you're a sinner and I'm a sinner. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we need redemption. So this morning, it's the opportunity. It's the opportunity. It's the time for you to say, man, I'm not going to correct myself. I'm not going to correct you. There's not going to be another person that comes along and corrects you. Your spouse can't correct you. We've all tried that, right? It doesn't work. That we're all sinners that need redemption. So this morning, I want us to bow our heads, every one of us. Our band's going to come up on stage uh, during this time. Uh, man, church has got to move from just being a moment in an event to like being like, man, I need real transformation. I need real understanding today. And as our heads are bowed... And I want this to be an opportunity for every one of us who are dealing with not our mistakes, but our sin. I want this to be an opportunity for each one of us to, to be bold about our sin, to be bold about Jesus restoring us. The enemy wants to lie to you this morning, church. The enemy is still fighting right now against this. He's saying, you're just here. Come on, seriously, don't listen to that guy. Please don't listen to the scripture. And he's maybe shifting it around for you this morning so that it'll make you feel like you can be corrected. Let's leave, let's leave no wiggle room this morning, church. The only space let's leave for, is for Christ this morning. Heads are bowed in here today. If you're a sinner this morning that needs restoration, if you're a sinner this morning and you've had it wrong this whole time, you just said, man, I've just been making mistakes, I felt like. Everybody else is doing that. Come on, really? But if you today are saying, you know, know what? No, I'm a sinner. And I want Christ to restore me. I want you to stand on your feet this morning. I want you to get to your feet this morning. I want you to understand what your sin looks like this morning. I want you to keep your head bowed in this place. And this morning, as you're standing, so many standing in this place, I want you to quit being so drugged down by your sin. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the one who they said we could call on when restoration needed to happen. That's who I'm calling on this morning. That each one of us who are sinners would understand that it's an opportunity to be restored to who Christ is wanted us to be. Stand boldly this morning. Father, I pray right now over each one of us who are standing as sinners, each one of us who are sick and tired of trying to fix ourselves, God. 
that each one of us are tired of reading the next self-help book, God, that we're just saying that we are sinners and we need a holy God and a holy Christ who can forgive us of our sin and restore us. God, help our mentality on this change from being condemned to being restored, God. Father, many of us who learned this as young, that God punishes evil, God, I pray that in this moment we'll understand that God sent a good son, his only son, to give us life and life to the fullest, restoration. Father, it's a message full of hope this morning. It's not old. It's not an old message. It's a message full of hope for today that we're confronting our sin, God. I pray that for each person standing in this room, young to old, that they would confront their sin this morning. They would confront the sin and say, you will not drag me down anymore. That they would confront the enemy and they would say, you will not drag me down anymore. But Father, as they sit on their knees, stand on their knees, or whatever it is in front of Christ this morning, that you would lift them up those who humble themselves before the Lord will be lifted up this morning. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Let us all stand this morning together. The brother of Jesus wrote one time or another, he had a travel document, and as he was doing ministry, he wrote in a letter and he said, those that humble themselves before the Lord will be lifted up. And you're there this morning, and many of you stood. You're saying, man, what does this look like in my life, that I'm, that I'm a sinner? What does this look like? It means that you have humbled yourself before the Lord, and that he is going to lift you up. And do you remember the words that he gave to the, the woman? He lifted her up, and he said, now, go and sin no more. Jesus is not a license for us to go and sin. Jesus is a license for us to go and be changed. This morning, I pray you hear this message. We're all sinners together. We're saved by grace in Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let me pray over us. Heavenly Father, each one of us standing this morning, I pray we will be a church that doesn't get it twisted, that we would think we're just going to do, 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 and we're going we're to do the pastor a favor by doing this, and we're going to do this person a favor. God, I pray that we are a church that are serving you because of your grace, because of how much we love you, because you have restored us, that you're restoring us, God, to who you want us to be. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the boldness of those who stood this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.